Welcome back to The Real Rejects. I'm Greg Alba. I'm John Humphrey. We're going to watch today from New Rockstars. Obi-Wan Kenobi trailer Easter eggs and breakdown. I watched this trailer like four more times last night. So many little clues we missed. Eric's going to point them all out for us. I already know them all. I figured it all out myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, this will be just for me then. No. I will be enlightened by this. Leave a like, people. New Rockstars is the bomb. Let's do this. Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of the trailer for Obi-Wan Kenobi, or should I say, Kenobi! Because Duel of the Fates is back in our ears, and all of the ghosts of Obi-Wan's past are back to hunt him as he strives to protect a young Luke Skywalker ahead of his rematch with Darth Vader. I loved this trailer, and I'm gonna break it down frame by frame because it is filled with awesome Star Wars Easter eggs, interesting clues, subtle details that you just might have overlooked. So let's go! <laughs> Arabian Nights! <laughs> the fight is done. We lost. The trailer opens with Anakin Skywalker's favorite stuff, sand! It coarsely and roughly and irritatingly gets everywhere under the twin suns of Tatooine. In the music, there's oh, this are. magical <laughs> little riff. The great John Williams is returning to do the music for this series, and this riff is so played cool. on a celeste, which John Williams loves to muse, like Ooh. in his Harry Potter theme. Oh, is that what that is? That is beautiful. Or if you remember the opening shot of the Last Jedi teaser, there's a little riff there. Yes. I just had this image in my head of John Williams going by his piano and going, I need something new. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Print that, send it to Disney. Actually, the music in the first section of this trailer is John Williams' theme from Revenge of the Sith called The Battle of the Heroes. <laughs> Just showing how, after all these years, Obi-Wan is still haunted by the memory of his friend's betrayal and what he had to do to him. Obi-Wan rides an Eopi, a Tatooine animal first seen in Phantom Menace. Yes. Yes. But also, the steed Obi-Wan was last <laughs> seen riding when he left baby Luke with Anakin's oh, yeah. stepbrother Owen Lars and his wife Beru in the final scene of Revenge of the Sith. This series will Much take place more 10 years later, in the year 9 BBY, that's 9 years before the events of A New Hope. This is the middle period when Obi-Wan, an exile under the alias of Ben Kenobi, keeps a watchful eye over young Luke Skywalker, keeping him hidden from the Empire as a farm boy living with his Uncle Owen and his Aunt Beru. He's supposed to age in just like 10 years into Alec McGuinness? Yep. <laughs> it's gonna be a rough life on Tatooine. Wow. <laughs> that is insane. Yep. <laughs> yeah, man, he's gotta get all ancient by then. Now, various other Star Wars titles over the years have touched on Obi-Wan's time during this period, saving young Luke's life at various points as Owen would warn him to stay away, and then actually at one point saving Owen from Black Crusader, that yes. Wookiee who just showed up in Boba Fett, giving BK that scar that we saw in his Head. And then at another point later than the show, when Luke is 12, he saved him from a crate dragon. Actually, you see Obi-Wan walking into town and slicing off a piece of meat. This actually might be a slab of crate dragon meat from one that he had butchered. Obi-Wan laments, The fight is done. We lost. Yeah, you'll notice his voice sounds a bit echoey here, as if he might be speaking these words while in a meditative state, communicating perhaps with Yoda, or maybe with Qui the ghost of Qui-Gon Qui Jinn. Yes, yes do it. Yoda told Obi-Wan that he would teach him how to reconnect with the ghost of his old master. An old friend has learned the path mm -hmm. to immortality. Your old master. Qui-Gon. Yes. How to commune with him, I will teach you. So let us all pray Liam Neeson returns to the series to impart this very particular set of skills. Moving on. Well, in the Clone Wars, he does at one point reconnect with Qui-Gon. What is that planet called? That fail? What a mortis? Damn it. Damn it all in oh, hell. I'm done you? with this video. You are the Star Wars expert. <laughs> yeah, that's what You're I'm known Failure. As. Fake nerd. And I do think there was actually a deleted scene that you could see of Yoda commuting with Qui-Gon. And that might be the exact clip on YouTube. <laughs> Yoda commuting with Qui-Gon. So Obi-Wan watches over the Lars homestead, looking just as it did in A New Hope, with Owen and Beru even wearing pretty much the same outfits that they wore in that first film. Actually, this is dark, but they are standing in the same exact 
spot where Luke will later find their corpse. Oh, oh my goodness. No. Just torch the home. Meanwhile, 10 year old Luke plays as a pilot. It looks like he's actually wearing pod racing goggles. And the way he pantomimes operating the controls and leans just looks so much like young Anakin piloting during that pod race. And right as Obi-Wan pushes in on Luke, the moment he zooms in on him, John Williams' Battle of the Heroes theme transitions so smoothly into the classic Force theme. Stay mm. hidden. Let's move on. Oh. Best song. Best song. It's choir vocals. Lucasfilm got dusted. <laughs> to hunting Jedi. Ooh, baby, what a needle drop. John Williams' Duel of the Fates is, of course, best known from Phantom Menace. But the music was always bigger than just Darth Maul's theme, because it's really come back throughout Star Wars titles. For the lyrics of the song, John Williams translated an old Welsh poem called Battle of the Trees into the Sanskrit language. He wanted to frame this duel as a kind wow. of pagan religious ceremony, almost like the spirits of both sides of this conflict, the Jedi and the Sith, shrieking like a Greek chorus egging on their mortal <laughs> champions. And that's Damn. how he's <laughs> still being waged now, as Obi-Wan faces Darth Vader once more, as he faces the Inquisitors, and maybe also faces a rematch with Maul. Because this is set one year after the events of Solo, a Star Wars story, which established Maul as the powerful head of the Crimson Dawn crime organization. Ooh. Now, in Star Wars Rebels, which is several years after this, Maul will eventually track down Obi-Wan to Tatooine, but this is something he would not yet know at this point of this show, so that rematch would not go down on Tatooine. But we do see Obi-Wan go off-world in this trailer. Either way, Maul could simply cameo in some other scene that would set him upon his revenge quest in Rebels. At least give Sam Witwer one more Man. chance to reprise this. Kenobi! Then an He's so good. speeds across this ocean planet towards his fortress. This is the ocean moon of Nur, and this is the fortress Inquisitorious. Oh. So let's talk about the Inquisitors. Originally, the Jedi Hunters from the 1987 role-playing game, Inquisitors were introduced in Rebels, explored further in the 2015 Darth Vader comics, and in the Jedi Fallen Order game. The they are a squad of Force-sensitive beings trained by Darth Vader to hunt down Jedi survivors of Order 66. They are led by the Grand Inquisitor, voiced in Rebels by Jason Isaacs, and played here by Rupert Ooh. Friend, turned Rupert Foe. <laughs> he lures Kanan Jarrus and his to a trap yeah. using the mummified remains of the Jedi Master Luminara Unduli. The Grand Inquisitor dies at the end of that season. There are some things far more frightening than death. But he was later revealed to be one of those Jedi guards in Clone yep. Wars who helped arrest Ahsoka Tano when she was falsely accused of bombing the Jedi Temple. And then later he helped arrest the true culprit, Barriss Afi. But from that experience, he learned the flaws in the Jedi orthodoxy. And that's what opened him up to be corrupted by Palpatine. And it would suggest that Palpatine did that to help expedite the fall of the Jedi Temple. I just want to say really quick, every time there's an adaptation from an animated character into live action, there's backlash. So the first thing I saw was backlash for Grand Inquisitor. It's going to always look a little different, guys. It's not something we need to throw our... I always think, what would it look like if we went in reverse? Can you imagine if Count Dooku <laughs> looked like how he did in Clone Wars? It would look super goofy. Yes, <laughs> you know, you, you gotta readjust here when you're doing it in the actual live action humanoid form. It's going to look different. It's gonna have to fit the aesthetic of the series yeah. as well. Now, the Fortress Inquisitorious is a secret location after the Inquisitors were forced to relocate from Coruscant, so that now they're really off the books. The moon of Nur is actually very close to Mustafar, where Vader's castle now stands. Uh. Their shuttles, which we've seen in concept art, have a two-pronged tip that matches the two-pronged tower of Vader's castle. Oh, of course, cool. we visit this uh. water fortress in the game Fallen Order, and that game reveals the backstory of the Inquisitor named the Second Sister, Trilla Suduri, former Padawan to Sira Junda. The Second Sister goes on to fight Cal Kestis, and in defeat, nearly forgives her oh. former master, but is executed by Darth Vader. Other Inquisitors include the Fifth Brother and the Seventh Sister from Season 2 of Rebels, who try to kill Kanan Jarrus and Ezra Bridger, and an arc that also introduces the Eighth Brother, an Inquisitor who had been trying to track down Maul. All three of these Inquisitors 
prisoners end up killed. There was also the sixth brother who had tried to kill Ahsoka Tano, but Ahsoka defeated him, taking his blades, kyber crystals, and purifying them white, which is why in Rebels and in Mandalorian Season 2, huh. Ahsoka has those twin white lightsabers. Cool. All that Inquisitor knowledge, yes, great. However, how baller of a move would it be? be if they actually got Cal Kestis to be in this show. It would line up. They already designed Cal Kestis to be in the likeness of Cameron Monaghan. So adapting him into live action, you probably wouldn't hear all those complaints. It looks <laughs> yeah. so weird now. What's wrong yeah. with this guy? <laughs> Those people find a way to complain about him. Now, if you look closely on the Fortress landing pad, that looks like a Lambda class shuttle there. That's the same kind of ship Vader and other Imperial VIPs use for transportation. So Vader may be present here checking in on to the next clip patience jedi cannot help what they are their compassion leaves a trail. So the Grand Inquisitor faces down what looks like a cantina barkeep on Tatooine. His armor looks as it does in Rebels, though here it has a badge that he did not have before. Maybe it's a special designation he gets from the Emperor that he loses after his failures on this series. Now later in the trailer, the Inquisitor Reva, a major character who we're going to be following on the show, played by Moses Ingram, stops a runner dead in his tracks in the same cantina. And in this shot, you can see Reva in the background on the right, oh, and then on catch. the left, the Inquisitor with a wide headpiece. This is actually the fifth brother from Rebels. Mm -hmm. Now in live action, played by Sun Kang from Fast and the Furious films. I had no idea. That's oh justice. That's, oh, that's so cool that he gets to do this. Oh yeah, that's absolutely. Great. Just that's justice for Han. This is how we get Asian people finally in Star Wars <laughs> under tons of makeup. Yeah. I'm just kidding. We've had several Asian characters already. Yeah, we've had enough Asian characters. We're done. Then we see a skiff on Tatooine transporting. It looks like workers, including our man Ben Kenobi, just blending in. I love how it puffs out black smoke, just making this look like a really cheap, polluting piece of hardware. Meanwhile, we hear the Grand Inquisitor lecturing, the key to hunting Jedi is patience. I they love cannot it. help what they are. Their compassion leaves a trail. You know what he's kind of like is Hans Londa <laughs> from Inglorious Bastards. That's what the speech sort of made me reminisce on. Because a glass of that delicious blue milk. Now I know to a lot of you that sounded like the voice of Palpatine, but according to the closed caption on the trailer, it was actually the Grand Inquisitor. But it's a really interesting perspective from a former Jedi raised in the Jedi Temple, now patronizing the Jedi as a cult-like mental disorder. Mm. George Lucas did originally conceive the Empire as space Nazis, and here the Grand Inquisitor's assessment see? evokes that. <laughs> <laughs> Nazis. I don't this see it. The Inquisitors is a sort of SS of the Empire. Then inside the lower <sighs> subaquatic levels of the Fortress Inquisitorious, Reva meets with the fifth brother and another Inquisitor with these tendrils. Both have on their backs the ringed double-bladed sabers carried by all Inquisitors, which allow them to rotate the blades like a helicopter rotor. And you'll notice one of these chairs has a tall two-pronged seat back matching both their ship and Vader's castle. So this may be Vader's the chair at this table or the chair of the Grand Inquisitor with that Grand Inquisitor trying to embody Vader's aesthetic. Then on Tatooine, someone is suspended on display, perhaps the fugitive that Reva chases down, looking like a message to the locals not to harbor Jedi. Like but crucified. rather than being hung from a noose, yeah. I think that'd be a bit dark for Star Wars. I wonder if this guy is actually being forced choked up over the ground and left to suffocate. Among these bystanders is Joel Edgerton returning as Owen Lars, <laughs> sweating like a gumped on Mustafar. Now it's seemed at first like these acquitters might be on Tatooine looking for Kenobi himself, but I don't know. If they got that close, I don't know if Obi-Wan would have been able to live for another nine years after this. Rather, I think there is another Force-sensitive fugitive who fled to Tatooine and just got too close to Obi-Wan, and this guy that goddamn planet, Kenobi man. would not be able to help, <laughs> else risk his exposure and endanger Luke, who is another Force-sensitive kid that the Inquisitors would probably target. So perhaps, while chasing this random Jedi, Reva then senses another presence on this planet that forces Obi-Wan to lead her off world and try to throw her off. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> That's, that's a really good plot there. <laughs> yeah, that's a good call. <laughs> he cannot help it. Where is he? Okay, here we see Reva on the new planet named Dayu. Described by the writer of this series as a Hong Kong-like setting with graffiti-ridden nightlife, the neon orbesh beside Reva translates to E-R, and then to her left as she looks out, letters spelling out milk. Kind of like old man Luke. Yeah. They love the lactate here. 
The Inquisitor shuttle <laughs> lands on Tatooine, and then a shot of Imperial officer played by Indira Varma, aka Alaria Sand from Game of Thrones. That's yes. where she's yes. from. You can tell by her badge, red, 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 blue, she is the rank of captain in the Imperial Navy. Then that female Inquisitor interrogates a lineup on the Dayu Street. You can see an Orbesh sign in the background translating to Haas Market. And as she walks right, the last suspect on the end is a large fur-covered fella that we cut away from quickly. A Wookiee, perhaps? Or I mean, an a Ewok. This is one year <laughs> <after> <laughs> so really tall Ewok. Is at large as a smuggler. Then we see this quick shot of a new droid, letters on his chest looking like they translate to Ned. I'm wondering if this could be Kamel Nanjiani's character, which would keep with the recent Star Wars tradition of comedians yeah, voicing the droids. Yeah, Steve yeah, yeah. Bridge, Matt Barry, Richard Iode, Alan Tudyk. Let's not forget, Bill Hader did BB-8. Yes, he did. Let's not forget Mr. Most Boss. iconic. <laughs> Let's not forget. And Richard Pryor was R2-D2. <laughs> 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 Correct. Then the Grand Inquisitor fans his lightsaber, never breaking eye contact. Now this bald dude does look a bit like the same head shape as Tamar Morrison, aka Boba Fett, aka every clone and clone trooper, making me wonder if this could be a runaway clone trooper after Order That 66. would be cool to do. Interrogated. And I only bring this up because there is another shot in this trailer showing the backside of some really banged up looking Stormtrooper armor. A little too scratched for Stormtrooper armor, plus it's it looks like blue. a bit of bloop. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. Could this be the clone trooper armor of Rex? Could Rex be in this show? I mean, I know he wouldn't die here because Rex survived. <laughs> that would be so <laughs> cool. <laughs> screen time to make up for those two episodes of the Boba Fett series. I would absolutely adore that. There are some clones who end up not being bad. There's a guy named Gregor. Hey, this is your guy. That's my guy. It's your guy, right? His name there. reminds me of someone. But if you brought Rex in there, and Rex was in Bad Batch, so clearly mm -hmm. they want to keep his presence alive. And if he's like that clone outside of Boba Fett who intersects throughout the series, from Clone Wars to Bad Batch to Rebels, and now to come into live action, I think that would be a really cool call. Or or Cody. Here, the fifth brother leads a squad of stormtroopers on Dayu. And yep, I translated all the Orabesh. On the far right, the last letters are huh? E-T. Maybe the last letters are the word market. And then the blue sign of the top of frame, I think, spells out the same thing as the other blue sign in frame, Gungan Snacks. Yes. And then on the right side, we see some pink letters with the green border. Also, the same word repeated with the orange letters in the green border, both spelling out the word market. And then on the far right in orange, once again, milk. Love you. I'm gonna dream about that. Space. <laughs> These look a lot like the pod used by Yoda in Revenge of the Sith to escape to Dagobah. Ah, this could yeah. be the moment he and Obi-Wan separate to their respective exiles, which tells us that we may see flashbacks oh. to Revenge of the Sith and flashbacks to the Clone Wars era. Then we see a black gloved hand touching a symbol chalked on a wall. This is the sigil of the Jedi Order, the saber flanked by the wings. This actually may be Reva finding a Jedi hiding place. Maybe the Jedi have used these markings to signal to each other and to keep the hope alive. Then in an alley, Reva stares down a gunslinger, like thinking this is Obi Wan, not wanting to out himself yet by using his lightsaber, instead opting for the blaster. So uncivilized. I love uh. how the backlighting casts a long shadow in front of Reva, which gives her just this fearsome edge, but also suggests that her opponent will have the light in his eyes for this duel. Then we see a quick mm -hmm. rooftop shootout that looks like Obi Wan engaging with some blasters coming from multiple different directions. I do like the detail of the laundry being hung up to dry. Now they huh. said they based Dayu on Hong Kong, and fun fact. In fact, in Mission Impossible 3, J.J. Abrams actually had to digitally remove shots of hanging laundry in Shanghai because local film distributors didn't want Shanghai to look poor. But in oh, space, interesting. Hong wow. Kong, Deborah Chow leaves the laundry in. Then an <laughs> overhead shot shows a vent <laughs> releasing these green birds. I'm not really sure, but the best known green bird in Star Wars is Morai, the female convoy who befriended Ahsoka Tano with a spiritual connection to the daughter, the mystical deity of Mortis. It is called Mortis. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Corvus. But until now, I don't think we've seen a whole flock of these. Still, I would love for Ahsoka Tano to cameo in the series, since presumably Obi-Wan will have to leave some babysitter looking after Luke when he leaves Tatooine, and it would give a bit more context to Ahsoka and Luke's moments in the Book of Boba Fett. Then again, Rosario Dawson would be having to play an Ahsoka 20 years younger than when we have seen her before. I don't know how that would work. So, on to the last clip. Let's get Ashley Eckstein back. Okay, after a close-up of Obi-Wan, we get the series title, which if you look closely, snuck in the shape of yes, Obi-Wan's lightsaber on that, that yeah. eye. Then we hear the iconic breathing of Darth Vader. And we know Hayden Christensen is coming back in the series to have an epic rematch with Obi-Wan Kenobi. It's super exciting, especially because if you listen closely, they use a specific music sting. 
<laughs> this is John Williams' Anakin's Dark Deeds track from Revenge of the Sith, right after Anakin slaughtered the Separatist leaders on Mustafar and bitterly stared into the lava and the flames, a tear rolling down his cheek. Ah, a real tear, not a digital one. And I love that they remind us of this moment, because for me, whenever I rewatch Revenge of the Sith, this right here was Hayden Christensen's darkest performance. Just simply his silent glower, his inner torment. There is a reason Hayden was brought back for the series, because think about it, if they just wanted Vader, they could have brought back the team they used for Rogue One. James Earl Jones doing the voice, uh, a couple stuntmen doing the performance. But no, they needed Hayden Christensen, because it's not just Darth Vader with the mask that we're returning to, it is the grief-stricken, rage-filled human underneath that mask. So this John Williams light motif is a promise that we will see this face again. Whether it's Invader's breathing apparatus or a close-up under the mask, the scarred face, or maybe a different form altogether projected in astral form, Obi-Wan will mm -hmm. have to look wow. into these eyes once more. These and lastly, eyes. you gotta love that blue lightsaber <laughs> cutting in to form the Disney Plus logo. Just between this and the Moon Knight leap in the Moon Knight trailer, this is essentially <laughs> the House of Mouse's new Tinkerbell swoosh over the castle, and I'm digging it. Also, check out our great merch options at NewRockStarsMerch.com. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at e Boss. Follow New Rock Stars. Subscribe to New Rock Stars for more analysis do. of everything you love. Right, Thanks I'll for subscribe. watching. And uh, oh, I forgot to say hello there. So um, uh, goodbye there. Yeah. It's gonna get really annoying for people. Everyone <laughs> who does these over one videos, whole bunch of hello there's. That's all you're gonna hear for the next several months. <laughs> hello there. And we're gonna be part of it That's too. Right. Part yeah. of the problem. Subscribe to New Rock Stars. Leave a like. And hey, we'll catch you all soon. Can't wait to start reacting to this series. It looks beautiful.